Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Nelson Martel um, here with the Ward 6 NPA meeting or June meeting. Um, this will be the last meeting before we're kind of on hiatus for two months. We'll be back in September. I think it's September 1st, actually. Um, uh, it'll just be me tonight for the steering committee. Um, and uh, I'm going to get started straight away. So uh, public uh, comment period, public forum. Um, anybody joining us online? Um, I know we have some folks um, in person who are going to make some comments. Um, and, and maybe we'll start there and see if we have other uh, comments before we move on to the first agenda item. So um, joined by Miranda and Eli here uh, to talk a little bit about um, uh, Champlain uh, Housing Trust. Um, can you take it away? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity. We uh, wanted to come in uh, during the public comment period just to um, meet with the MPA, um, recognizing that um, we wanted to introduce a project that we've begun working on. And I'm joined by uh, my colleagues, a couple of them on the screen here, um, Michelle Caver from the VFW and uh, Taryn Barrett from Duncan Wisniewski Architecture. And Eli is also from Duncan Wisniewski Architecture here. We've um, started work on a project um, on South Winooski Avenue where we are working with the VFW on a potential redevelopment of their site. And so as we started to kind of map out our permitting schedule and think about um, our work coming up and planning to come to the NPA, um, we realized we might not fit in, you're about to take a summer hiatus as you just mentioned. And so we might not um, be able to present to the NPA for our public meeting and might need to schedule kind of one outside of your regular schedule. So wanted to, to come tonight just to meet with you and uh, be able to introduce the project concept. Um, uh, we're hoping to submit the permit plans to the city maybe in September. And so um, that might mean a, a public um, meeting before then um, and would love any you know, suggestions or input you might have for um, how we should approach that if we do need to schedule a meeting outside of the, the NPA um, regular meeting schedule. So um, as I mentioned, our, our projects at uh, 176 South Winooski Avenue where the current VFW building is. Um, and our concept is a five-story building with nonprofit commercial space on the first floor uh, and four floors of housing above. And um, right now um, we're planning likely 38 apartments between 35 and 40. Um, and we hope to have a special preference for uh, veterans for some number of those units. As I mentioned, we're working with Duncan Wisniewski Architecture um, and Taryn and Eli are here. You know, we only have a couple minutes, just wanted to um, give you the concept and we don't have plans to share with you tonight. We will do that at the, at the next public meeting, but they can tell you a little bit more about the um, design elements that we've worked out so far. Turn it around, over to you two. Darren, would you like to, to start? Sure. Thank you for having us. Um, sure, so we're looking at developing the site as Miranda mentioned, and we're, the, the visual for the building will largely be driven by um, zoning. This is in the downtown code district, and so we're following form-based code. And form-based code tells us a lot about the density of this building and how it will look and sit on the site. Um, we've learned that it'll dictate how far away from the street the building is, how wide the building is, what some of the features are like the roof overhang, the desired height um, within a certain range up to 65 feet, uh, which we don't intend going quite that high, but five stories will get us close. The first floor has to be 14 feet. We have regulations on um, the minimum amount of glazing and distance between entrances along the street and windows, um, materials. And so all of these things are going to be influencing what, what the building will look and feel like as we get in to its design further. And if there's any questions about that or, or how this comes together, I'm happy to talk to them outside of this meeting, but I'd rather, you know, stay focused if anything comes up right now, then use your time to reiterate what's in the form-based code, which is available if anyone wants to take a look. Sure, well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks for the, um, the introduction. 
Um, we'll absolutely be talking to you guys about how to schedule a meeting if it needs to be out of sequence. Um, but any any responses or comments um, from anyone joining us? Yeah, please? Alan Matson, uh, Ward Six resident. Um, sorry, I'm late. But quickly, I don't know who is the developer. Who is? I'm sorry. Clean Housing Trust. Oh, it is CHT. Okay, gotcha. Okay, I didn't know exactly what was going on or exactly who was developing. But okay, great, thanks. Sure. Any other questions or comments from anyone either in the room with us or online? Uh, yeah, this is uh, Greg Eplerwood. And uh, yeah, I'm just uh, curious as to um, where the VFW will be going. Great question. So uh, the VFW is planning to sell the site to the Champlain Housing Trust, who will, with our co-developer Ever North, develop the um, the building. And our plan is at, at the post's request that then we would sell a portion of the first floor back to the VFW post um, for their use. So it would be a condominium within the building. Thank you. Welcome. Any other questions? Of course, that got me thinking, is this just going to be the only condominium in the building then? Or is it just going to be like a two unit building? It's likely to be three units because okay. we'll have two um, commercial spaces on the first floor, but both will be for nonprofits. One for the VFW post, the second is not determined. Sure, the right. And the third would be the housing above. Okay, great. I know a couple of your buildings that have had some smaller, you know, small condo units set up. Thanks. Yeah. Maybe you can yeah, keep you that. Can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> that work okay to do that? How about you take that one? Yeah, okay. <laughs> we can share this one. <laughs> it's perfect. But Ward 6 knows you never hand me the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments um, on, uh, for our guests? Well, thanks for allowing us to come during the public comment period. And uh, we look forward to talking with you in the next couple of months um, about the community meeting where we'll get more input because we'll have some drawings to show. Perfect. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Eli. Thanks, Miranda. OK. Um, the, we're on to the first agenda item. Um, I have a few comments. I have a comment. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Yes, one? Greg, any other comments unrelated? Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm uh, Greg Eplerwood. I'm the uh, Ward 6 clerk. And in that position, I have to uh, manage our local polls uh, each election. And as you know, we're having a, a primary coming up on August 9th. And um, I just wanted to uh, let you know, although it's a little bit back of the house, it is related uh, to um, the workers who will be, will be recruiting next month, that is in July for the August uh, election. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I attended along with uh, several other ward clerks um, around Chittenden County, including uh, Charlie, who I think is operating camera there right now, I'm not sure, um, at, to get training on the new Dominion tabulators that will be arriving in uh, Chittenden County very soon. Um, the old ones, I think they said 15 or 20 years old, uh, will be replaced and um, they're really very, very good. I mean, if you can get excited over tabulators, I think you'll get excited over these because they are so powerful, wonderful functions. The um, sessions were uh, the session was conducted by uh, Will Sanig. He's the um, director of the Vermont uh, Secretary of State Elections Division and a representative from the state um, service provider of the machines. Uh, Mike Carlson, I think, was his name. Who was there? And um, so I just wanted to give you a heads up that um, we will be recruiting workers again for this election, both the August and the November election. And uh, just keep your eyes on Front Porch Forum and word of mouth. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you at the polls. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Greg. Um, sorry, I'm just getting up to speed here on my on my machine um, with the the Zoom audience. Um, any other hands raised that I'm that I may not be seeing just yet? Okay. 
Okay, great. Well, so then um, I think that wraps up our public comment period. Um, first agenda topic um, is um, uh, the Isham Street Gardening and other optimistic, other optimistic doings. Uh, Brian Sheena is here with us. Brian, uh, you can take it away. Thank you. And I'm joined tonight um, by one of our newer but very active members of Is Good, Molly Lawrence, who's going to present with me. Um, may I share my screen? Do I have permission? Oh, I do. Look at that. Yes, please do. Can you see that okay? Yep. All right. So um, we're here tonight to present a call for citywide action to engage in mass gardening and other optimistic doings. Um, and this is from Is Good. Isham Street Gardening and Other Optimistic Doings. Um, and I'm presenting um, down here at a community meeting regarding the new pod village um, because I wanna be part of that. So forgive me for being downtown. Hopefully there's not too much background noise. Um, so we have here a call to action to the people of Burlington. Um, oops, did I just change the screen on accident? Nope, we're still seeing it. All right, I clicked on some, something else, which is not confidential, but I, was, I thought I lost control of my screen. So it's, this is a call to action um, for the people of Burlington to join in mass gardening. We can mend the social fabric that's been torn by the pandemic um, through the act of community gardening. Regardless of how many of, of our many differences, we can join together to cultivate the land on which we live, building relationships, developing community, meeting basic needs, nurturing beauty, spreading seeds of hope. And this call to action is inspired by the lessons learned through manifesting the vision of Is Good. Is Good, Isham Street Gardening and Other Optimistic Doings is a mutual aid and community building project that has transformed Isham Street over the past 13 years or so from being one of the most neglected streets in Burlington to being a model for how neighbors can improve their quality of life through social action. We learned that gardening improves quality of life. Through our community organizing around gardening and our good deeds, we improve the physical and social environments of Isham Street and crime rates, uh, crime rates drop significantly when compared to surrounding streets. So this is a quick review for those of you who don't know what we do. So, so you'll get our call to action. Um, we lowered crime rates so much that the police noticed and we wrote a grant with them in 2014 to um, bring the knowledge and skills developed through the Is Good program to other neighborhoods struggling with quality of life issues. Um, and I'll share these slides publicly if you wanna read in greater detail. Um, but there were significant changes in crime rates and the only change that, um, that the police could identify um, was the gardening and the community organizing surrounding it. Um, at this point, I'm gonna hand over um, this, uh, the presentation to Molly Lawrence um, to share some more information on um, ways that gardens affect quality of life. Thanks, Brian. Hi, everyone. I'm Molly Lawrence, Brian's neighbor, and I work locally in community health. And my family moved during the pandemic to the neighborhood, and it's been a really nice way to connect with neighbors during an isolating time with a new baby. So thanks, Brian, for all your work organizing these great efforts. And as you shared, this is about more than community gardening. It's really about um, fostering connection, investing and grounding in a shared sense of place and promoting collective well-being. And I'm not an expert in community gardening, but I think the findings, Brian, that you shared from the Is Good Project are really promising. And they're also validated by research, including some of the compelling findings that I've shared on this slide. Um, community gardening has improved mental health and resilience, feeling safer and decreasing crime. Locally, you've demonstrated that, and then nationally, there's some really compelling findings. And during the past year, few years, many community members are reporting feeling increasingly isolated um, and experiencing an increase in mental health challenges. And I think this is an especially important time to invest in community interventions like this that promote connectivity and well being and connection to um, the environment. So we wanted to share a little bit about the benefits that you can see for mental health and well-being and some really amazing research coming out of Philadelphia right now. Every dollar invested in greening saved uh, $333 they calculated. Um, so that was really compelling. I think we can move to the next slide, Brian. Thanks. Um, so here we are with um, phase four and Brian, of course, you and 
the other neighbors have really spearheaded over the years, these first three phases and moving into phase four of the collective effort, we've been expanding gardens, including, um, was it last weekend or the weekend before on the green belt of Booth Street, um, most recently trying to get out and connect with folks and create, um, continue connecting existing green belt gardens designed by the neighborhood. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. So. Um, as we are implementing phase four, we're calling on the rest of the city to join us to begin phase five, which is to connect and grow other existing community gardens across the old north end and around the entire city. We want to link the gardens into a network of greenways that continue to expand until the entire city is a model of urban permaculture, the Emerald City of the Green Mountains. So this is just an example of where we're at now. You see phase four creates an intersection between two greenways in the old north end, the Wiggle, which goes from Loomis to North Union, to Grant, to Peru, to down uh, Sherman, to Battery Park. And the phase four of Is Good, which will cross um, at Loomis and Booth, but then link to Pomeroy Park. Um, but here's an example of like what phase five could look like. So phase five, as we continue to expand, you see the neighborhood around the park begins to green and the, the garden ways begin to link. And if we do the same thing over by Roosevelt Park, you can see here how you could pretty easily, um, you know, Decatur Street's an existing green, you know, Green Street. We could pretty easily link all of these um, parks and green spaces into a network in the old North End. Um, the question is, what can you do in your neighborhood? And that's why we're here tonight. We have a call to city for citywide action to engage in mass gardening. So to start, um, we would ask, you know, we're just encouraging people to do things that are simple, like pick up trash or waste as much as possible. Consider ways to green up your property and to eliminate blight. Talk with neighbors about the vision and see if they're interested in any kind of involvement. Do you want to read some, Molly? Sure. Yeah. Help your neighbors take care of existing gardens. That's a big one. Always looking for people to water the gardens um, and, you know, dress blight where you can. And like you said, expanding existing private gardens, the green belt community gardens, if you see places that could use some, some plants or greening up um, and really just an opportunity to connect with gardeners all across the city. Um, and Brian, I'll pass it back to you. Yeah, and we could buy, we could enhance more neighborhood tool banks and other existing mutual aid networks, work in partnership with the city as much as possible. Um, imagine in your neighborhood how garden um, walkways could link into the existing city garden and landscape infrastructure. For example, Main Street's about to become a garden street. Uh, St. Paul Street has become like a garden street, City Hall Park. So if, you, if you're in the South End, there might be ways to build walkways that link into that infrastructure as it develops. Uh, we want people to explore resilient permaculture options as climate changes so that we can increase local food protection, production and protect food security. And ultimately, um, we encourage everyone to love thy neighbor. And so um, if anyone wants any help in your neighborhood, planning um, ways to build garden walkways, we're available. And there are people all over the city who are interested. Um, so we'll stop there for questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Brian and Molly. <clears throat> any questions? I'm not seeing any hands raised, but um, I, I, I think it's really intriguing what you're doing. I'm, I'm excited um, and actually kind of inspired by your maps to go take a tour through the, through the neighborhood. Um, so thanks, thanks for all that good work and thanks for the information. And um, if you guys send along uh, contact info, we'll, we'll post it in the meeting notes. Thank you. I, I mean, oh, yeah, I just was sitting there thinking it actually. Hey, Brian, Alan Matson. Um, How's it going? Um, so up in our neighborhood, recently they put the rain gardens in the street. They were installed last year uh, up on the top of the hill, fairly close to here. Um, and right now I think the city is still supposed to be doing some of the work in those, but you know, are those, I don't know if you know what was done there, but when you said you did bump outs, um, was that something you had the city do for you or how did you do the bump outs in the street? Because that's really what the city has done for us. And I think we may already have built in opportunities to take these bump outs a little farther even than the city has uh, with their um, water remediation ideas. Yeah, so I, you're, you get the you get the gist of this, which is like looking at existing infrastructure and enhancing it. And we on Isham Street, we had a crumbling street. We had no bump outs. All the trees were dying because trucks were killing them, bringing like supplies to Burlington Health and Rehab. Um, and it was very blighted, but 
um, when we asked the city to work with us, um, we asked for the street to be repaved. We asked for bump outs and trees. Um, we, and we asked for sidewalks to be fixed over time. They listened to us and worked with us and they put in bump outs, they put in trees. As those trees have succeeded, they've been putting in more. They've been, um, they repaved the street and have been fixing the sidewalks. So, um, but then, you know, they're on Booth Street, they have different infrastructure. Um, so what we're trying to do now is now that our, the infrastructure of the weakest link has been mostly fixed, we're trying to enhance the existing strengths that, that are along those other streets where there are bump outs and rain gardens. So if you have them in your neighborhood, that's a great opportunity to start in those places, you know, start in the places that are already gardens and, and, and see where you can strategically expand and, and um, connect them. So. Great, okay, thanks. And um, one thing I will say is that we get grants um, from various sources over the years, including CETO. But we also, once you have perennial gardens, you have to divide them every year. So like it's exponential. Like as we're planting these gardens and you have to divide them, it like doubles and quadruples. So if the whole city starts doing this in like 10 years, you know, we could probably sell our plants or something. So. <laughs> <laughs> All Give right. them to an ET. <laughs> <laughs> Brian and Molly, thank you very much Thanks. for joining us. Thank you. Oh, oh um, sorry. If one, if you can hold on one second, it looks like we have a hand raised. Uh, Rebecca, do you want yeah, to go ahead? I was, gonna, I was just going to say that if you don't know this already, the uh, library downtown has tools that you can borrow, like rakes and shovels and so forth. I'm, I'm not sure what the inventory is right now, but um, you can borrow them just like you borrow a book. So if people are in needing something like that, for short term. Thank you for sharing that. That's an uh, example of the tool bank that we were talking about, but there's others too. So it's good for us to know like the library is probably one that everyone with a library card could use. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that with everyone. Very cool. All right. Thank you very much. Um, and we will get your info posted into the notes. Um, we're going to move on to the next agenda topic. Um, which I, I see we have uh, Mariah and Evan with us from the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community. Uh, Mariah and Evan, do you guys want to take it away? Sure. Thank you so much for having us. I'm going to share my screen as well, as long as that works. Hold on. Um, there we go. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, so uh, I'm Mariah Flynn, I'm the director of the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community, which is a substance misuse prevention coalition that serves Burlington. Um, we've been around in the community since about uh, 2008. And um, we do a lot of different work related to prevention and prevention kind of encompasses a number of things. But today we just wanted to share um, one specific tool that we made for the community to use and let people know that it's there. Um, so you can think about how it um, connects to your interest in Burlington around substance misuse um, or healthy community um, and how you might use it in your ward. Um, so, uh, but I did wanna share that our coalition is focused on um, primarily on community level prevention. So I wanted to just explain what that is so that um, it can be clear kind of what our, um, why we're focusing on this particular area. So um, I just, uh, on the screen, you'll see the Vermont prevention model, which uh, is something that uh, the health department uses to show the, um, it's a socio-ecological model for prevention, which is kind of how many public health uh, folks think about prevention or prevention of any um, thing, whether you're thinking of domestic violence or tobacco use or prevention of alcohol use. Um, usually there's a, a model like this where you're looking at um, impacting different levels of a system. Um, so the most effective places, or at least where you have kind of the biggest level of impact, is looking at the policies, systems, or the community levels. Um, and so the work that we're doing is really focused on those two circles um, around policies and systems and community, but mostly at a Burlington um, level. Um, but there are lots of other organizations doing great work in that hit some of those other levels. So when we all impact various areas, that's how we can do effective prevention. 
Um, and we also do some work in the relationships and individual level. So the example maybe that Brian was talking about, Brian and Molly were talking about around the connections and the relationships that get built around community gardening can be a great prevention tool too. Um, but that's at the probably the relationship level. Um, and so we're looking at, we're gonna talk about some of the, another level. So we've created, um, uh, oh yes, I added little arrows there and I forgot about that. Um, and the reason we're um, gonna talk about this tool that we made and why this is so important um, is that we know, um, or one of the reasons that I'm gonna focus heavily on youth and talking about youth as we talk about what the policies and systems in a community and how they impact youth is that we know that substance use disorder um, is really an adolescent disease. We know that people who develop substance use disorder usually started using before the age of 18. Um, so nine out of 10 people, um, which, mean, which is why you'll hear me talk a lot about youth and the impact of various things on youth. It's because that's where we put a lot of our time and energy when we're thinking about prevention. Um, but a lot of the things that, um, that help support youth also help support folks who are in recovery and trying not to use. Um, uh, or, um, and adults too. Um, and so one of the reasons that youth are so impacted is because substance use, um, while the brain is still developing, um, is, um, is what leads folks to have more problematic use. And so if we can delay use for as long as possible while the brain is developing, most likely people will um, be able to have more responsible use as they get older. Um, and so just to give a quick little overview of where we are in Burlington, there's so much data around substance use in Burlington, so I'm not going to take time to talk about all of it, but I just wanted to give folks a little bit of a lay of the land. So this is the Vermont, risk, uh, Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey data for our Burlington High School students um, for the last decade or so. Um, and kids just took another round of this survey in the fall of this last year and that data hopefully will be available this coming fall. But one thing that you can see is that um, we've had kind of a little bit of ups and downs in alcohol use here. Cannabis use though is on the rise for youth as well as electronic vapor products, both use of cannabis and tobacco or nicotine in those products. Um, and then we're seeing some decrease in cigarette use and prescription drug misuse. So there's some, um, some places to be thinking about how we help support youth more and some places where we're seeing some success and we wanna keep building on that success for kids. Um, and you know we could talk about data all day. So I'm just gonna give you that quick little snapshot. Um, so one of the things that um, we, um, know is that what can help prevent and delay use for youth is to make healthy choices the easy choices, both for adults and for kids, because we know that kids are highly impacted by what adults in the community are doing as well. Um, so we created a tool to help us see how easy we're making healthy choices for people when it comes to substance use, legal okay. substance use, I should say. Um, so uh, we've, in uh, 2018, we did an assessment of all the tobacco and alcohol retailers in the Burlington community. Uh, we had, um, we did what we call store audits where both staff and volunteers and, and health department officials went and to all of the retailers in the community. And we looked at things like how much advertising do they have? Is the advertising outside the store? Does it light up? Is it under three feet? Um, are, are products like alcohol and tobacco very cl closely placed like within 12 inches of products that are really um, appealing to youth like candy or, um, or toys? Um, so we did an assessment of, a, of each store individually. And then we looked at, um, geographically the impact of stores within the community. So we looked at the density of stores within various places or advertising within various places. And we put it all together into a map, um, an online interactive map that people could kind of look at your area and see what are the impacts in my area and the area where I live. Um, and we overlaid it with census data around socioeconomic status and um, 
and uh, school locations and other things that might be important to think about for that data. So I'll share that. That's the tool that I'm talking about. That's what you can use to think about have we created um, an environment in which people can succeed around these substances or do we have some things that we want to think about as a community. Um, but I first want to just share, like, it's hard to look at an online map, so I would encourage you to just take some time on your own and do that. And I've pulled out some pictures and some data that might be helpful to take a look at. So just to like set the stage a little bit, we know that some of the root causes of youth substance use or those um, risk factors within a community are normalization of, of use or misuse, access to and promotion of substances in the community, a low perception of harm, for adults and youth. So one of the reasons we're struggling right now around increasing cannabis use rates for youth is that there's definitely a lower perception of harm for that substance. And that's something we have to, that our organization is trying to work on, helping people to understand um, why we don't want kids using. Um, and then early onset abuse, that use earlier. So those are the things we wanna promote or we wanna be looking at. Um, and, our, uh, the other thing I want to note is that all of the visuals in this presentation were taken from the Burlington community. So, and most of them were captured by youth um, at the middle and high school who were taking pictures of things that they saw as problems within the way kind of substances are promoted in the community. Um, the few are were taken by our staff. Um, but the, you know, we're not trying to target any one retailer or place. So you won't see any identification of who those stores are. We just wanted to show some visuals because visuals are helpful because the, the conversation that we're hoping that people will start to have is the overall picture of the community and what your community looks like and what you want it to look like and how do you plan for what you want it to look like. Um, so one of the risk factors for substance use is that if community norms are unclear or encourage use, um, and so one of the things we found in some of the assessment that we did, and actually I'm going to take a quick note, I forgot to mention that we, like I said, we did an assessment in 2018 and um, we have updated the maps with a few things that have changed since then. But the advertising data is definitely from 2018, but most things have not changed around that in our community. We are currently in the process of working with Department of Liquor Control to update all that data. So by the end of the summer, hopefully we will have um, new data from 2022 that we add to that map. Um, but most of this is pretty, uh, has stayed pretty standard in the community for a while. Um, so in Burlington, we know that we have uh, higher rates of alcohol retailers who have ads on the outside of the doors that are visible from outside of the doors and windows of the store that are visible from outside. Um, and we also have more advertising inside the stores as well. <clears throat> um, and I should say that while we did this assessment in our community, other communities across the state also did it as part of some Department of Health um, funding a few years ago, which is why we were able to compare with other areas. Um, we also saw that there was uh, a fair number of, to, of advertising that was under three feet, which is a, a thing that we um, note, um, because generally that's at eye level for kids and not adults. Um, and so I pulled out this visual for your community, which I think is a um, helpful for this ward, as uh, most folks I am imagining have students at the elementary, at Edmonds Elementary and Edmonds Middle School. One of the schools that we found that had the highest percentage of tobacco and alcohol retailers within um, like a short distance of the school was Edmonds Elementary and, um, and Edmonds Middle School. Um, and uh, some of those, you know, are, are either close by or within your ward. Um, so that was one thing that the students noted that they were concerned about. Um, and I just wanted to quickly highlight, well, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna focus on it much today, is that there are things that are protective factors, things that we can do and that are, are happening in Burlington that are also encouraging non-use and are supporting healthy choices for kids, like our smoke-free zones in some areas, like our prescription drug um, uh, take-back boxes. So there's a lot of great work happening too. 
Um, and just this is the work that I do all the time looking at data around this kind of thing so we can have conversations about it as a community. So in case folks aren't as exposed to this kind of data as much as I am, I thought it might be helpful to just include a few um, notes in here. Um, basically, the kind of key takeaway is that youth and kids are much more influenced by advertising than adults are, um, which you probably know already. Um, for any products. Um, but one of the things that we find across alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis is that kids are being exposed at much higher rates and that that exposure means more for them than it does for adults. Um, and I included cannabis or marijuana advertisements here. And I, in both, I just use the language that the research uses. So you'll see that there's uh, marijuana and cannabis are kind of used interchangeably, which isn't always fair, but, um, but I, I wanted to represent the data the way they represented it. Um, so I use that because uh, there's so much conversation happening around cannabis right now. I thought it was really important. But one thing you should note is that this is pretty much the same for alcohol and tobacco. We're seeing that exposure to that type of advertising kind of increases the likelihood that either that either youth will use or that they'll have favorable attitudes about use, which we know that in time leads to um, a higher percentage of folks who will initiate use. Um, so now on to the story map. Um, and I'm gonna see if I can just, so let me click right on that. Well, okay, great. So I thought I would just like quickly show you a little bit of a visuals and folks on your own time can take a look and kind of play around with it um, and think about how you might use this to help stimulate some conversation about what we could do differently. Um, so this is the story map. It's just an online map. There's some kind of preamble of the types of things that I've gone over in my little presentation. What is the problem and what do we, why do we care about this type of stuff? Like I said before, all the visuals that are in here are kids in our community, images from our community. Um, we're not ta um, taking any, I don't think I've used any images from anywhere outside of Burlington. Um, but the thing I wanted to show you was the maps. So, um, so there's three different maps on here that you can take a look at and play around with. This one is looking at location. So um, where are the, um, the retailers in the community that sell substances? Um, and there uh, you can see in the uh, little key on the side that they're noted, uh, different types of retailers are noted um, there and it shows um, some of the concerns with density that folks want to be aware of. We know that actually one of the <clears throat> biggest things that impacts use is density. How many places are within, uh, you know, a certain area? Because that the more that you add, there's a lot of different reasons why that's um, important. But one is that it shows that normalization of use. Um, the other is location. So we've mapped the retailers with an overlay of the location of schools. And uh, I believe also included in here is youth centers um, in our community. And then we showed in a visual a thousand foot buffer from a school and a 500 foot buffer from a school. So that's so recommended in some policy um, recommendations nationally are to create a thousand foot buffer from a retailer of a retailer from a school. So it shows you what that would look like and who, what kind of places are captured within that. Um, and then we've also overlaid it with um, uh, socioeconomic status or uh, rates of poverty in the community. Um, so you can see kind of where, um, where there might be connections between the density of retailers um, and, and uh, that data. Um, and one thing we aren't able to kind of track as well, but it's important to know is that uh, particularly the tobacco and alcohol industry, um, and we'll see where the kind of growing cannabis industry lands, but um, has aggressively marketed products to, um, to populations that are uh, like, um, like BIPOC communities, like LGBTQ communities. Um, so we want to be really thoughtful about uh, how we're doing that. And, in our community and what, how we're responding to that and supporting folks. Um, and so in here, you'll also see there's um, some uh, recommendations for the 
kind of what research shows are the best policies to impact change around reducing substance use at a community level. Um, and some tools at the end for um, uh, some tools at the end for uh, how you can learn more, how you can work on this at a community level. Um, and um, in this, I'm not going to go into great detail in this um, presentation because I wanted to give some time for questions. But in here, I've also listed some of those recommendations, um, but they're also on the story map. Um, and so the kind of summary that I just wanted to leave folks with is that we know that the earlier people start using substances, the more likely they are to develop problem use. And the substances that kids almost always start with are alcohol, tobacco, and cannabis. And sometimes in any, uh, it can start in anywhere on that spectrum. Um, and so the goal is that we delay youth use for as long as possible while brains are still developing. And that social norms and access to and promotion of substances is known to increase underage use. So communities can do a lot to limit that exposure um, by thoughtfully considering about how we allow advertising, how use in public spaces, density of retailers, um, and norming, norming at, of adult use. And that is the end. So I've listed my contact information. You can always call me with questions. You can learn more about us on our website um, and then also um, a link to our story map. Great, thank you, Mariah. Um, any, any questions um, for Mariah? Alan. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Mariah. Um, with the cannabis industry about to open up, retail, et cetera, are there, or have there been any, I don't even, I probably should know the zoning restrictions, um, advertising restrictions or anything that you've been, that, that are being put in place based on kind of the information ideas you're putting forward here? Yeah, Such as so- buffers, buffers around schools, et cetera. Yeah, so the um, Cannabis Control Board is still working all of that out. So that's the board that will uh, decide what the regulations are for the state that have to then be approved. Um, and um, so all of those things are still a little bit in process, but what they have recommended is a 500 foot buffer from a school um, and um, from a school campus, I should say. And, um, and then there are some restrictions on where advertising can be um, when a certain percentage of the population that visits it frequently is youth. Um, so there will be some, some restrictions that are kind of standard for the state. And then beyond that, communities or municipalities can do additional restrictions uh, as they see fit. And have the communities that have basically uh, green-lighted uh, retail, have they started doing any of the restrictions on that, or are they waiting for the statewide board to make their first round of uh, regulations? I think it's kind of all over the place in Vermont right now. So I'm connected to other prevention work happening in other communities through other coalitions like ours. And I would say that like, like all the towns are grappling with this question that you're bringing up, okay. which is really important. <laughs> Some yeah. are like get, digging right in and starting that work now. And the Cannabis Control Board did include in their regulations that, um, that you really have to make some of these policies before retailers start, because once a retailer kind of has a license and is in a location, they're automatically grandfathered in to whatever policy is made afterwards. So if you say put a thousand foot buffer from a school, but there was already a retailer who had started that person, that place would be grandfathered in basically. So, um, so you'd want to, um, to you know, be doing this work sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Any other any other questions? Don't see any others. Um, Mariah, thank you for the information. Um, we'll, we'll get uh, your contact info posted in the notes as well. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for the time this evening. Appreciate thank you it. so much for having me. Please reach out anytime. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, we are going to move on to the next agenda topic, which is an update from our um, Vermont House representatives, uh, Tiff Bloomley, Gabrielle Stebbins, and Barbara Rachelson. And I'm, um, I'm not sure if I'm 
just not seeing Gabrielle, or maybe she won't be joining us tonight. She, she is joining us. She is a single parent um, tonight <laughs> and um, is, you know, doing the juggle. And so right. um, <laughs> at any rate, um, she will be joining us. Um, so thanks so much for having us. I know that we've we've got um, about 15 wow. minutes for this. Is that right? 20, we have 20 minutes. I think we've been running a, a few minutes long on each presentation. Okay. So we'll, we'll start the clock now. All right. All right. Well, um, we've kind of divvied things up based on the committees in which we serve. And, um, and there probably are some uh, remarks kind of off committee that each of us is going to make. But um, there is a, I can put it in the chat. Well, I, actually, I can't put it in the chat. But um, Nelson, I sent something, um, uh, an address, <clears throat> a, a web, um, a link to the um, session report um, that could be in the chat so that um, folks can take a look at that. We're going to put it out on Front Porch Forum as well. But, um, you know, one of the issues that uh, we, um, as, a, as a caucus, um, have talked a lot about and is in the news all the time and is of concern to many people in this district is housing. And so my committee deals a lot with housing. Um, and so I thought I would just talk a little bit about um, what we did this year. And <clears throat> um, the so we passed two big bills. I just for a little context over the past three years, the General Assembly has committed about, well, well over $300 million to housing and the, roughly half of that from COVID relief funding and half from the general fund um, and the property transfer tax. And um, we've spent it on a wide range of things, um, constructing new housing, bringing rental properties that are offline because they're um, not up to code, back online, um, uh, providing emergency services to folks um, to support them um, if they uh, don't have a home, um, incentives to develop accessory dwelling units, um, and down payment grants for first generation home buyers. The, <clears throat> this year, the legislature uh, appropriated over $90 million um, for housing projects. And the federal money was really, really important, um, obviously, because we've never been able to make these kinds of investments in housing. And we're making up for a lot of um, lost, you know, opportunities to invest in housing. Um, there, there are kind of three factors that contribute to the housing shortage. One is a stagnant growth in developing um, new housing. that has been an 87% drop. Um, since 1980, and um, Airbnb rentals have taken a lot of rental units off the market. Um, also, all of the, the properties that are not to code and are stand vacant. Um, under investment, um, we've kind of rated the property transfer tax that is supposed to, at least of 50% um, of it, go towards investments in housing and conservation. And we've used, we've, we've, we've nibbled away at that and never given, or maybe just in two years have given the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board what statutorily they are um, allotted. And then finally zoning that discourages density. And so <clears throat> this year we had two major housing bills that tried to address a lot of uh, all those things. Um, one, to dedicate $20 million towards forgivable loans to property owners to bring rental properties um, <clears throat> that aren't cut back, that aren't, oh my gosh, that aren't up to code back online. And we also put in $22 million to subsidize new construction to lower costs for middle-income home buyers. That's uh, the, the governor talked about the missing middle. <clears throat> um, and um, that was a significant commitment. About a third of those units will actually be perpetually affordable. Um, um, and <clears throat> we, there is a million dollars for down payment grants for first generation home buyers. Um, 
We in, embedded in this legislation were um, reforms of zoning laws and expanding tax credits to encourage um, development and density. Um, we added <clears throat> additional protections from discrimination and harassment for renters and home buyers, um, as that has been, um, uh, testimony has reflected that that's been a real um, uh, continue, continued problem. Um, we <clears throat> created a contractor registry for, uh, to protect against consumer fraud in residential construction projects with a value of over $10,000. And, um, and we, we have invested uh, $50 million in low-income affordable housing through the Vermont Housing Conservation Board. And um, that, <clears throat> I, I, I think, I think we all feel as, as a legislature really proud of these legis this legislation. Um, the other things that I'll just mention quickly are, you know, we made significant investments in childcare, $15 million. Um, we also had um, made, there were certain populations that um, uh, the Committee on Human Services turned its attention to one, you know, expanding the options um, of places where adults with developmental disabilities can live, um, education and coordination for families and caregivers of people with disabilities um, <clears throat> and um, Alzheimer's. And then patient choice at the end of life, um, allowing a patient um, to have uh, their meeting with their medical professional online. Um, which obviously would be um, really important for certain patients who are not able to travel great distances. And those, all of these, I think, were um, in terms of kind of investing in human beings um, and their well-being. I, I think these are um, real marks forward. And I would just say personally that my disappointments um, well, the, our failure to take up paid family leave, um, uh, the women's prison, where I think that discussions have been really focused on the, the actual building and not the, the programming um, and, <clears throat> and um, alternatives to incarceration. And finally, the failure to override the governor's veto on um, and, and the governor's vetoes in general, because we came up with some Really good bills that um, that I you know we're going to have to take up again next session. So I'm going to turn it back now over to um, uh, Barbara. Um, I'm, I don't even need to say anything. I'm just turning it over to you, Barbara. Thanks. Um, hi everybody. Um, Barbara Rachelson. I. Uh, represent Chittenden 6-6, which will become Chittenden 14. I think at our last MPA meeting, we talked about the new districts, so I won't talk about that. I do want to say that um, all of you should feel really great about the representation that you received this biennium. Both Tiff and Gabrielle have been amazing colleagues and uh, it's hard to believe they've only been there one biennium. So um, it's, been, it's been really fun and important that our, our Burlington delegation has uh, worked well together across parties and um, really have tried to do right by Vermonters and also make sure we're in particular looking out for the issues of Burlington. Um, obviously weighted pupil, um, the spending formula was a big important development that so many of you that are listening and in particular school board members and advocates like really helped with um, heavy lifting and giving us the people power to convince the legislature that we really needed to follow through on that. And while in a future biennium, it may make total sense to redo. In fact, we need to look at how we're funding education. 
when I've been collecting signatures, everybody is talking about property taxes and their concern about um, how do we fund a new high school? How do we make sure our students have a safe environment to learn? And so I know that we are all gonna be looking for funding to help with um, paying to, in this case, abatement was not the right decision, but to build a new school, it was the, you know, a wiser decision in terms of fiscal um, management. And we will, should we have the honor to be elected again, um, be fighting to make sure we're, we're um, addressing those issues. So I serve on the House Judiciary and the Judicial Nominating Committee. And House Judiciary has been super busy. Um, so I was gonna just take my time to, um, not take my time, but take the time that I have allotted to just talk about some of the highlights for this, um, uh, what our committee did. We did pass some more gun, um, safe gun laws that make sense and are based on evidence. I know many of you just heard about a hospital shooting this week and um, happily the governor signed the bill that we passed to make, to ban guns from hospitals. Um, we also signed, no, the governor also signed a bill that allows us to make sure the courts know that they have the authority in emergency relief from abuse, abuse orders, also known as the red flag law or um, IRPA, to temporarily um, make an emergency order to remove a gun. The data has been so clear that in domestic violence situations, when guns are not removed, um, lethality and other very bad um, gun injuries are five times higher than um, if there's a gun in the house. So that's really important. It gives people a way to get their gun back quickly, but it also takes the gun away in a very heated situation. Um, we also, uh, I'm sure you read about it. I know we talked about it earlier on, the Charleston loophole bill originally, um, it was for longer based on the evidence of how long it takes possibly to make sure that the right um, person is identified that is trying to purchase a gun and is clear to have one. So that ended up being a compromise and um, it got that period got shortened, but we are very relieved that we were able to make headway on it. Uh, we all, I know there's been discussion informally among um, my colleagues of uh, continuing our work to make sure that we are um, fighting for gun um, safe storage and other, um, as I said, evidence-based um, laws that could make a difference in the gun violence that we are seeing in our country. It is unacceptable that the major cause of death among um, children 18 and under is gun violence. And um, that is unfortunate. We did um, do some other laws. One is H546 got passed, which is going to create the division of racial justice statistics. Why do we need that? This, we know that there is incredible disparity in our criminal justice system in Vermont. We've seen that data. It's been limited to basically police stops. And this um, new law will allow us to collect data, um, not only on um, law enforcement interactions, but state attorneys, Vermont courts, Department of Corrections, in order to see where the problems are and remedy systemic racial bias and disparities. Um, there will be an advisory committee um, council created to incorporate the data collected and um, make suggestions for concrete actions the legislature can take moving forward to make sure that we are welcoming people of all racial and ethnic backgrounds. Um, very quickly, I'm sure my time is running out. 
we did, this has been a bill that um, has been introduced many years, but we now are the first state in the country to have medical monitoring for Vermonters exposed to toxic substances. And um, this is in the form of Act 93, and it provides a cause of action um, for compelling the party responsible for exposure to a toxic substance to cover the cost of medical monitoring to those affected by the contamination. And that is really important because people have not been able to afford to get medical monitoring um, on their own when they've been exposed to these very dangerous chemicals. So that's something else that we're extremely excited about. In terms of disappointments, um, another bill that I had introduced, um, and this year um, I partnered with uh, Republican legislator, uh, Felicia Leffler from Enosburg to eliminate um, civil forfeiture. And that bill passed the House unanimously on a voice vote. The Senate turned it into a study. And that is something that I'm really disappointed about because um, it allows, it means that in the meantime, innocent owners can lose their property because their property is considered guilty of a crime and it doesn't give them the right to counsel. And most of the people that lose their property can't afford an attorney to get it back. So that's a big disappointment and um, I'll end there. And turn it over to Gabrielle. Okay, sorry, thanks. I was looking for my mute. Uh, so I have the area of sort of climate, environment, um, uh, water quality, that sort of thing. Um, It'll be probably a surprise for folks to know that uh, of all of the New England states, Vermonters have the highest per capita greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and that is in part because we drive so much. Um, and uh, as a result, while, while you look at our overall environmental policy over the last 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, you'll see so many incredible strides that we've done in terms of building renewables, weatherization, efficiency Vermont, uh, cow power, biodigesters. Uh, but we still sort of struggle to get at some of the really key hard nuts to crack. Uh, and one of the things that happened before my time, right before uh, Tiff and I came in, um, was the passage of the Global Warming Solutions Act, which actually said, okay, Vermont, instead of taking these individual pieces, you've got to go at this as a, as a holistic approach, um, which resulted in the first Vermont Climate Action Plan. You guys probably already know all of this, uh, but I highlight it because it highlighted from the first Climate Action Plan, which was released, I think in December of last year, basically it said, uh, in the transportation world, we should join the Transportation Climate Initiative, which unfortunately two weeks before we uh, would have maybe actually, I drafted a bunch of bills or had a bunch of bills drafted to initiate and join the TCI. Uh, it's a region, regional approach to reducing transportation uh, costs and emissions. Um, but two of the states that were actually key states, linchpin states to make that policy work, Massachusetts and Connecticut, had bowed out. So that was a key piece of where our emissions come from, where our costs go for Vermonters. I think a lot of people are feeling a lot of pain at $4.70 at, at the gallon. Um, so that one went aside. I'm sorry to jump to the uh, disappointments right away, but that was outside of Vermont's control in some way. Another piece was the clean heat standard, um, which was supposed to really focus in on how we heat our homes. Uh, a lot of us heat our homes through forms of fuel, maybe not here, uh, because a lot of folks here heat their homes with uh, VGS, with Vermont gas, but many, many other Vermonters heat their homes with wood or oil or propane. And those types of uh, heating fuels, it's harder to regulate because they're not regulated from, from the state level. Long story short, that one we lost, uh, the governor vetoed it and we lost it by one vote on a veto override. Um, but all of that being said, we did do quite a bit. 
first of all, the Climate Action Plan said, wow, if you're going to reach these Global Warming Solutions Act goals, you're going to have to do all of this in weatherization. You're going to have to do all of this other amount of work in terms of shifting away from fossil fuels. You're going to have to do all this other work in terms of having you know, electric vehicle charging stations or buses or ways to like uh, commute that aren't so fossil fuel intensive. And so we ended up uh, landing with uh, one and a half million to support trades uh, in work-based learning and training programs, three million in trade scholarships, uh, about 15 million in career and technical education, construction, experiential learning, uh, about 2 million for folks like Audubon and uh, Vermont VYCC, folks that are really bringing the tools of how do you have a job that can make a difference, but you're starting at the beginning and um, you, know, you can make a decent living. So that's my favorite part of, of what we passed only because it's a win-win-win. We have folks learning trades, they're gonna get good meaningful jobs and they're gonna help us reduce our costs and our, our emissions. Um, we passed a bunch of bills re regarding protecting biodiversity. We did pass our first ever environmental justice policy bill. We passed a lot of money to address water quality. Um, this is with regards to stormwater retrofit projects, community scale water and decentralized wastewater projects, um, how to address toxic wastes, helping municipalities. Uh, you know, we see more and more flooding events, how to help them actually process all the water that's coming through. Um, in terms of transportation, we put aside 18 million or so for electric and high efficiency vehicle incentives, bicycles. This is everything. Quite, quite a bit of it is actually earmarked towards low and moderate income Vermonters. Uh, and it's not necessarily just electric vehicles. It's also just more efficient vehicles. Uh, we did secure through June of 2023 um, fare free again, which uh, for folks who take the bus, it, it's amazing how much how, how much of a struggle that was. Uh, it was really just the Burlington region um, that wasn't going to get it. Uh, everybody else in Vermont was going to be able to continue getting fare free, and it was sort of the Chittenden County area that wasn't going to be able to continue to see fare free. Ironically, if you're fare free, you have fewer fights, um, you have less uh, passing of um, potential germs, think of COVID, the fights because someone only has 95 cents instead of a full fare. Uh, and so there are um, multiple reasons why it helps to have fare free, but the truth is it still costs something. So we're gonna continue this through June, 2023 uh, and do analyses with Green Mountain Transit to try and figure out how do we move forward from here? Um, and finally, after many, many years of trying to identify quite a bit of money for weatherization and efficiency, we have about $80 million for essentially making your home uh, tighter and more efficient. Uh, we have $20 million for upgrading home electrical systems. If you think of a home having a heat pump, a heat pump water heater, an electric vehicle, all of that means you might have to upgrade your overall panel. Um, quite a bit of money for advanced metering and 45 million to help our municipalities because if our towns are paying for, uh, you know, high cost fuels, then so are we. So 45 million to help our towns and cities with technical assistance, energy assessments, and to weatherize their properties. There's a lot more to be done. We had two years of incredible funding, um, but I think the hardest part moving forward is we know we're not going to have that. And frankly, where I found the hardest part was when we actually spoke about policy. And uh, how do you, how do you, if we know folks need to get around, but we also know folks don't want to pay for other folks to get around, how do we balance that policy to really communicate and develop uh, the neighborhoods and the towns that we want here in Vermont? So a lot of great work, a lot of work to be done. That was um, that was a lot. You guys are busy. <laughs> um, thank thank you so much for for all of that information, Tiff. I did receive the link. Um, we'll make sure that we post that um, with the notes um, to to get the kind of full rundown. Um, any any questions for our representatives? Connie, you know, I just want to say that I'm grateful for all of you to returning and that I'm really I'm worried about the big turnover in the legislature and 
So it's really great to have people who are so engaged and who are willing to do another couple of years. So, or at least, thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. <clears throat> um, I, I just wanna say one of the things um, Representative Bloomley brings to the table, sorry Tiff, is that she's an incredible collaborator and um, uh, part of, thank you, Representative Rachelson, but part of the reason why the Burlington community uh, crossed every type of party line and really came together multiple times was because Tiff kept saying, let's work together. So I'm so grateful that I have these two people here to work together. And it does mean that we bring a lot more to the table and um, for lack of the better term, a lot more firepower. Great. Well, thank you all. It, it is um, it is great to have such engaged representatives, as Connie said. So so thank you. Um, we'll post the kind of the full report um, in the notes, and we're tracking behind on schedule. So I'm going to go ahead and move us to the next um, next agenda topic, which is an update from our city councilor Karen Paul, Ward Six Councilor. Hi, Karen. Thanks for thanks for coming tonight. Thanks. Thanks for. Uh... Thanks for having me um, on a fairly, fairly good evening. Uh, maybe not 80 degrees, but maybe that's why we're all able to be a little bit, a little bit more comfortable being inside this evening. Um, so, uh, you know, there's always a lot going on, um, but I'll try to just raise a couple of issues and then I'd rather hear from others. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll try to try to keep you a little bit closer to being on time. Um, so as many of you are aware, we um, are had a population shift in the city of Burlington. Our population increased and it, um, you know, like most populations, it did not increase equally everywhere. So we need to redistrict. Um, on the state level, they call it reapportionment. On the city level, they call it redistricting. Um, and we um, uh, were down to three different map configurations that are uh, that we're considering um, returning to the seven ward map, which is what we had prior to 2015, the eight ward map, which is what we have now, um, or there was an interest in having a 12 ward map. Um, haven't made a decision about the number of counselors. Some people want uh, 12, some want 14, and there are some who want eight wards and 16 city councilors. Um, this Monday, uh, the uh, 6th of June, we're going to have a community forum on redistricting. Anyone who has um, an opinion that they would like to share, a perspective they want us to hear about um, from 6 to 7, we will be taking um, information from the community on redistricting. Um, and this is about, I think, the sixth or seventh opportunity that people have had over the last year to speak with us or the ad hoc committee about redistricting. Um, and then after that, we will try, um, I will be encouraging the council to try to narrow it down from three configurations to at least two, and maybe if we're lucky, we'll get down to one, um, and then we will work on figuring out exactly how that map is going to work. Um, there will be, there definitely are going to be some changes, no matter what ward and then what number of wards we go to, and there are going to be some changes to Ward 6 um, in particular. Um, the other item is the budget. Uh, we've had our all of our budget presentations by department, and we will have another opportunity to talk about the budget next Monday and the Monday after, which is the 13th. And then on the 20th, we need, um, we have to vote our charter says we must vote for June 30th. And we try not to wait until the very last meeting. We try to do that on the 20th, if not the 27th. Um, and um, with the exception of two departments, um, every other department um, has been responsible for some amount of budget reduction. Um, not a lot, but, you know, in, and it has not been related to services, but mostly 
uh, if I could encapsulate how some depart most departments are, are, are trimming back, it's in the areas of uh, travel, can outside consultants, um, and um, subscription services, you know, as best they can, nothing that impacts the, um, the taxpayer. Um, then we're in the midst of union bargaining. Um, that will go through the summer, although uh, there may be some that we'll, we will be able to settle with sooner, but we have four unions and we are working on that now. Um, uh, Burlington Electric is gonna be coming to us this Monday with a rate increase. It's not huge, um, but then again, it is. So, um, you know, certainly concerning and that's why it's being placed on the deliberative agenda. Um, it's 3.95%. Um, we're in the midst of um, uh, dealing with commission and board appointments. That will come to us probably on the 20th as well. And then um, the last thing, and certainly I think, I hope everyone will feel as good news for the city of Burlington is the recent announcement um, by the three local partners of City Place that um, the phase that we most commonly refer to as the pit um, is now um, being run by the three partners, um, the three local partners, one of which is Dave Farrington, who's a Ward 6 resident, and um, uh, Don Sinex is no longer involved with that phase of the project. So um, we'll look forward to being able to support a, a project run by local people um, and hopefully some activity there in the not too distant future. That's, that's about all I've got. Thanks, Karen. Um, any, any questions for Karen? Not seeing any hands raised. Um, Karen, thanks, thanks for the update. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, a lot of important things coming up for, for the city. Um, yes. Claire, Thank you. thanks. Um, so uh, last agenda topic for the evening is um, an update on the Burlington School District from uh, Claire Wool. Claire, are you with us? Yes, thank you. Driving. <laughs> yes, yeah, we are at uh, BHS playoffs, the BHS boys tennis team. Uh, we are here, the girls. So I am this week and next week, we're our Vermont D1 school uh, state playoffs. So we are at the court side. So thank you for allowing me to join in via Zoom. Thank you, everyone. Um, our updates are... Um, Similar to uh, the city, as far as um, I'll start off with, we are currently bargaining with our seven bargaining units here in the school district. Um, and we will be working uh, closely and hopefully um, before the school year, um, complete those bargaining, um, that bargaining work with our unions. Um, so I wanted to talk about that first. Second is next week is our official last week of school. Um, most of our Burlington High School's graduation will be on Friday, uh, and the middle school's celebrations of learning will be on those Thursdays, and the elementary schools um, as well. They're all of our last days of, of, of in-person learning will happen next week. So that's it's a very busy and exciting time of year, um, and we're appreciative of all the faculty and staff and families that have been so supportive this year. We still do our daily um emails to all our public school families about COVID cases and counts. And fortunately, it has been low um, uh, in the last couple of weeks, but it does tend to spike every now and then. Um, and um, we are just very grateful that we have completed the school year um, with our schools and all our faculty and staff and families. Um, the biggest item we are working on as a district is our future Burlington High School and Burlington Technical Center at 52 Institute Road. Um, four weeks ago, the board approved the concept C. Uh, we had um, five different concepts um, that were approved by the board to move forward to schematic design. And we will be bringing uh, to the public our next phase of um, input and engagement on June 14th. That will happen in person at downtown BHS. Um, and we will be 
publicizing that through our NPAs now and also um, our North Avenue news column, our school board column. I uh, give a timeline of, of that update on that project um, and the bonding um, that will be coming to voters in November. And so please, if you're available to come June 14th or via Zoom, well, it'll be a hybrid. That'll be the next uh, public engagement of updating. We have worked uh, with the mayor and um, council president Paul on communication and um, being a part of the city council meeting meetings starting later in June um, throughout the next five months as we um, tackle the large task of bonding for this, uh, our one and only high school and our tech center. And so we feel that it is incredibly important to work uh, with in collaboration with city council so that everyone is informed, all citizens are informed and our communication is clear uh, and there's a roadmap for citizens to follow um, and, and support. Um, and um, Lastly, there was one other thing I wanted to share, um, but I think that was, uh, oh, we have a school board meeting this Tuesday, and we will be discussing in the month of June um, exactly what that bonding amount will look like um, and funding uh, cleanup of the site um, and the different aspects of the pro project as a whole, as an entity. So this coming Tuesday, we have a school board meeting and then we'll follow it up with the 14th, our public engagement. And then we have another school board meeting on the 21st. Um, and then we will be meeting, um, we will be coming to city council on June 27th. Mm, that's. That's what I have so far, but happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Claire? I'm not seeing any, Claire. Um, but, well, I guess I have one. How, are, how is the tennis team doing? The boys uh, are second in the state and the girls are second in the state. So we, the boys will chase after St. Johnsbury for the D1 title. We hope if all goes well and the girls will chase after Stowe and South Burlington for the D1 title. So thank you for asking. <laughs> all right. <laughs> um, and any other questions for Claire? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Claire, for making time for us tonight. Thanks, everybody who um, took some time out of their day and evening to, to share uh, updates with us. This will be the last meeting for a couple of months. Uh, like I said at the beginning, we're off in July and August. Um, the next meeting will be September 1st. Um, we are looking for steering committee members. Um, so if anyone uh, here who's stayed to the bitter end of this meeting um, <laughs> wants, to, wants to help us out, that would be fantastic. Or if you know somebody who might be interested, it is a, a relatively low um, effort opportunity to participate and um, s speak with all of our elected officials and, and stay tuned uh, to, to what's happening in our community. So um, we would love to have you join us. We're aiming to get back to um, in-person meetings, fully in-person meetings, hopefully, um, when we come back in the fall, uh, kind of um, situational, <laughs> uh, dependent on, on where we're at with the kind of health situation, um, and, and, and really kind of hopefully reinvigorating this, this, um, uh, th this meeting of our, our neighbors um, back to what I understand what it was before, before I joined. So, um, uh, thanks, everybody, um, and good night, and uh, we'll see you around the neighborhood.